Hi there, I'm your host, John Iverson, back after the summer's hiatus. And we're, this week we're going to look at the return of Parliament, which, uh, which comes back on Monday. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the Honourable Erin O'Toole, former leader of the Conservative Party of Canada and now president of strategic intelligence firm Adit North America. Erin, welcome. John, good to be with you. So let's set the table. Every opinion poll shows the Conservatives with a double-digit lead. Uh, the US presidential race has been turned on its head by the uh, entry of Kamala Harris, but it doesn't appear to have had an impact in Canada. We've seen the NDP rip up the confidence and supply agreement with the Liberals. And to add spice, this week we've seen uh, the Liberals, Liberal caucus convene in Nanaimo and be joined by Mark Carney, the former Governor of the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, and some say an heir apparent to Justin Trudeau. So the political landscape, it seems to me, has been pretty arid for the past year. Nothing much has changed. Voters seem almost habituated to the idea of an incoming Conservative government. But I guess there are, as we saw with Kamala Harris, there, are the, there is the prospect of seismic change in some form, be it a new Liberal leader or the NDP catching fire after the end of uh, the Liberal agreement. Is there anything on the landscape which you see as a potential for catching fire? Not really right now, John. You know, I made a prediction a year ago that uh, Mr. Trudeau would likely announce his intention to to leave just before Parliament returned this fall. Uh, I'm running out of time for that prediction to come true. It seems like he's going to stay, but the polls are locked. Clearly, people want change. Um, the government is appearing tired. Shuffles haven't worked, these sorts of things. And I think Jagmeet Singh was recognizing that even his association with the Liberals was dragging the NDP down. So they severed that agreement. But as this parliament started out, uh, when I was still the Conservative leader, they can just vote uh, on a case-by-case, bill-by-bill basis and rely on the, on the NDP, rely on the bloc. So I don't think that much has changed. The only real Hail Mary pass that Mr. Trudeau could have if he doesn't want to leave would be some formal agreement with the NDP or some sort of forced merger um, or perhaps trying to force an election on a very controversial or or large policy move like a universal basic income or something that would be so dramatic that it would maybe distract from their unpopularity. But I think that's unlikely. He seems to think that he can bounce back. I don't think he will, but um, he's he's quite lucky his caucus doesn't have the Reform Act like uh, like mine did because I forced the, the issue and, and uh, that ended my leadership. I think there's a lot of Liberal MPs that would really like Mr. Trudeau to move on, but uh, but they're probably saying that in, in, in private, not in public. Right. I mean, it must be a risky move for Trudeau to, to bring in Carney to that caucus meeting, and people get a look at the two men um, side by side, and presumably many of them have made the calculus that, that uh, pretty much anybody would be a better bet at the moment, but that Carney would be a particularly good bet. I find it a very strange move uh, as well, John. You know, Mark Carney is a very accomplished individual. I have a lot of respect for him. Obviously, Conservatives, we appointed him to head the Bank of Canada, and then the Brits seized upon that. Um, he is quite out of touch, though, with the, the needs of, of regular people, and I think sometimes that will happen when you're in those sort of cocktail circuits around the world. He doesn't realize the real impact of, of inflation, the cost of living, and really the divide. While he's from Western Canada, I don't think he realizes that the the policies on energy and on pipelines that Mr. Trudeau have brought in have not just been bad for our economy, they've been divisive for our country. And I think Mr. Carney has been a major advocate of many of those reforms. And whether it's some of his global banking initiatives or, or ESG work, a lot of that stuff is tumbling down anyway because of global populism. So. I think he's probably the least in touch with the average Canadian family uh, in that room in Nanaimo. So I'm not sure how he's going to help the Liberals reconnect with Canadians who've lost faith in this government. But he's certainly a name, and they're trying to bring in a flashy name to to show they they understand the economy. But the poll numbers indicate otherwise. So let's drill down a little bit. Um, the end of the confidence and supply agreement 
in, in Jugbeat Singh's estimation at least, makes an election more likely. But it doesn't seem to me that the NDP are in any particular shape to have an election. If you look at their um, revenue numbers for 2023, they were on 6 million, the Liberals were on 15 million, and the Conservatives were on 41 million. So they need time to raise money. Uh, it sounds like the bloc is willing to play ball, not only willing to play ball with the Liberals, but keen to play ball because they think they can get concession, concessions for Quebec. So how long do you think this thing can stagger on? You know, I think it's really up to the Liberals, you know, how how much they want to play the sort of wedge politics or how much they really try and want to have workable bills that will get, get the votes they need. Um, some people have speculated about proroguing Parliament and coming back with a throne speech. That then wipes the slate clean. And so C-70, the foreign interference bill, would have been the last bill to really get through Parliament, it kind of sets everything from scratch, John. So that gives them more time too. So they they might do that, but the NDP problem you've na you've nailed it. They've got not only financial problems, but really some of the heart and soul members of his caucus are leaving. So when we used to deal with the NDP, when I was Conservative leader, we used to deal with Jagmeet in his office. But often uh, my team would advance things with Charlie Angus as well, who who is kind of the unofficial uh, caucus person that a lot of NDP MPs looked to. Um, they've had four or five members, including Charlie, announced that they're leaving. So are they drawing in good candidates to to replace these sort of long term, you know, well-respected members? That's a big question. But the NDP, if they do well in, in the Montreal by-election or if they hold on to Daniel Blakey's seat in Manitoba, that might give them a little wind in their sails. Who knows? You know, certainly our conservative win in St. Paul's was a, a major national story. You know, I was a by-election winner and used to bemoan the fact that nobody paid attention to them. I think the whole country paid attention to the St. Paul's win. So I think this, this session will start off where each party is going to try and stake their, their claim to being there for the Canadian people. But I think the Conservatives have such a large lead, it'll be hard for the other parties to to encroach on that. It seems to me Singh is uh, trying to take on Pierre Poilievre's Conservatives uh, and almost ignoring the Liberals, where I think in previous elections have shown that when Jack Layton was successful, it was because he hammered the Liberals and he became the, the standard bearer for the progressive left. So uh, anyway, we'll see about that, but to your point on the Conservatives, uh, it does seem like, like it's Poilievre's election to lose. Um, and that maybe his biggest enemy might be triumphalism or even complacency. Uh, to be fair to them, though, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, signs of complacency or ill discipline. Uh, I mean, he makes intemperate comments, but he means to. So it does seem to be a pretty uh, well-organised effort right now, pretty focused effort. Very much so. I think, you know, Pierre is remarkably disciplined and he's running on a couple of the key issues that he's been talking about for many, many years. So when I was leader, um, I, I loved his work on highlighting inflation and how um, this was going to really squeeze Canadians, both in the, in the lower and middle classes. Uh, he talked about how the rise in asset prices was really creating two Canadas, you know, an urban wealthy Canada where where things were great and a working class sort of middle class Canada where people were having a hard time making their payments. So he's been on this issue for many, many years. He's not going to deviate from it. Um, some really good stuff on housing. Some of the policies were in our platform in 21, but Pierre is able to pr present them with with videos and really connect with people. I think Pierre is probably the first Canadian politician to really understand how to harness social media, um, uh, YouTube and other formats to engage people and to reach out. Um, sometimes it causes uh, challenges, but I think when you're when you're really trying to hit balls out of the park, you're going to have a few foul balls from time to time. But he's going to stick on those issues, crime, the, the economy and inflation, housing, and I don't think they're going to deviate much from that. One area where he's, he's been kind of drawn into commenting is immigration. But it seems to me that is not going to be 
um, a loser for him. He's not, he doesn't approach it from the same direction as Donald Trump, for example. It's more of an economic issue. And it seems to me the Liberals are particularly vulnerable on this file. Um, you know, there's a plurality of support for, for uh, immigration, which was mainly economic for over 40 years. Now that consensus is in jeopardy because the Liberals opened the floodgates to non-permanent residents. We've now got 2.8 million non-permanent residents. Now, whether they did this to depress wages at the bottom end and, and try and fight inflation, or because of labour shortages, it, it, it hardly matters. But um, it does seem to me that uh, Poiliev's message that he will lower inflation, uh, sorry, lower immigration, not, not for nativist reasons, but because we don't build enough homes and there aren't enough jobs. That seems to me a winner and maybe even a breakthrough for the Conservatives in Quebec. Is that a, a prospect, do you think? I think it is. You know, John, I've been around politics, as you know, for some time. I've never seen the national consensus change on an issue so quickly. And I think uh, it's for a number of reasons, you know, rising populism, uh, economic uncertainty, but also the Liberals have mismanaged a program that generally was run very well. We had record numbers of, of new Canadians come when I was part of the Harper government, for example. Immigration is a strength. It was a bipartisan um, uh, supported program. But when you start accelerating dramatically temporary foreign workers, the students, when there was quite frankly ridiculous rhetoric like you, you saw with the Century Initiative and uh, and things saying we needed to reach 100 million people in Canada. A lot of that was coming from kind of the liberal consulting class, you might say. And I think they bought into it. The problem is the cities and the municipal levels of government were slowing down building. Things were not getting getting built. And so we our ambition was was outstripping our ability to actually make sure people had success when they came here. And then also Roxham Road. I remember when I presented a plan for Roxham Road years ago, I was called racist by people. And then two years later, when the, the US government asked Mr. Trudeau to close down Roxham Road, he implemented exactly what we had been saying. So I think in the past, if you ever sort of said we needed to slow down immigration a little bit, people would accuse you of being anti-immigrant or as you said, nativist or xenophobic. Um, because we see that in some of the European far right parties. Everyone in Canada supports immigration, but they want people coming to have success. And they're not going to have success if they're living six to a basement apartment in Brampton and going to a phony community college just to get in the country. So I think we really have to clean up the program while we also talk about the benefits and the need for smart immigration. It's always been a a strength Canada has had, and the Liberals, by by politicizing it a little bit, have turned that strength into a bit of a weakness. So Trudeau, and, uh, I think it seems to me that he's left the median voter behind uh, in so many areas, and I think that that's uh, the byproduct of um, him telling himself, "We're going to do what's right, not popular." Well, I think as a politician, all pol politicians have to be be aware of what's popular and where the median voter is. So the, the, the upshot is that he's behind in support with every age group in every region, with both sexes, and on every major issue. But one glimmer of hope I saw that occurred to me was when I, his interaction with the steelworker in Sault Ste. Marie, where um, I thought he handled it as well as anybody could probably handle it, a, a kind of hostile voter that you come across. And Aaron, you know better than anybody that campaigning is Justin Trudeau's strength. Do you think that a kind of back-to-basics campaigning model would give him a semblance of hope, or is it too far gone? You've got 85% of the people wanting to change. It's too far gone, John. And I think this is why I still think he might announce uh, in the next coming months um, his decision to leave. I I've never seen a, a turn on someone to the degree that I have the Prime Minister. And I I'm being respectful here. You may remember what what the media dubbed Harper derangement syndrome in 2015, where I would encounter people that just wanted a change from Stephen Harper, couldn't even explain it. They would just get get upset. 
I'm running into people and of course they come up to me in many cases voted for me and so they want to talk politics. I'm meeting lifelong liberals, John, uh, including from groups like the Ismaili community and, and ones that, that Pierre Trudeau was, was seen as helping them come to Canada and that Trudeau family was almost mythic within some of these families. And they've said their entire family is is tired of, of the prime minister and want him to move on. And um, it, it's really quite amazing how, how that has developed to the degree it has. And I don't see him being able to change that by bringing donuts and, and getting into respectful conversations. I respect the fact that he did that. I respect the fact that four years later, they're following the advice we had on steel and aluminum uh, tariffs and working with the US on China. They were completely out of line with our allies. So he's pivoting, he's going back on tour, but I can't see him pulling this uh, out of the hat, John, and I, and I can't see him really finding an issue that he's going to be able to demonize uh, the conservatives with. I think he's he's gone to that bag of tricks too many times, and I think people just want change. Do you think a Trump presidency would make any difference? No, no, and I, I do I do think that, you know the the liberals will try and and use that if if Mr. Trump wins. But I, I do think it's too far gone. And I think uh, Pierre has been around long enough and has a very distinct brand that uh, is very different to Donald Trump. So I don't think anybody could, could that's, a, that's an available voter, John. You know, we know Twitter will lap it up and the, and the various little tribes on Twitter. But available voters who might actually be thinking about things are not going to buy the line that the conservative leader is, is an extension of of U.S. politics. I think um, I, I don't really see any option with Mr. Trudeau unless he's able to orchestrate some formal merger or some long-term deal with the NDP and certainly doesn't think the, it doesn't look like Mr. Singh's uh, open to that. So this is going to be a no. tough session for him. The, I mean, the only volatility or potential for volatility, I guess, is that there is polling which suggests that conservative supporters say their vote is more about dislike for Trudeau than like for Poiliev. And I guess there is always the prospect of strategic voting where Greens block supporters and, and New Democrats come out behind the Liberals. But um, it, I think it would take something pretty dramatic for that to happen, no? Yeah, and I think, look, you know, when yeah, I, I salivate when I see poll numbers with the Conservatives 20 points ahead. My gosh, I not even in my wildest dreams would I have had that. Uh, and certainly the Conservatives know that there's a good portion of that that is kind of an anti-Trudeau element. So, John, to your point, say say six points of that is, is the anti-Trudeau. That still has the Conservatives up by 14 points uh, or double digits. Right. And when, as you said, Getting into demographic groups, I meet a lot of young professionals now that we've uh, relocated back to Toronto. Um, this housing dilemma where they see excessive spending in Ottawa, shutting down parts of the economy, and now they're beginning to realize my generation is going to really be behind the eight ball because of some of these policies and because of inaction. That's why you're seeing um, even younger voters. This isn't just rural Western uh, or rural Ontario voters, they've they've been uh, against Mr. Trudeau for some time. This is spreading into demographic groups that I think the Liberals used to take for granted. And so, um, you know, barring, you know, barring something cataclysmic, I don't see those trends changing. And I think the more people see Mr. Mr. Polya, they get they get uh, comfortable with him. They see he's laser focused on three or four things that happen to be the top things. Uh, in terms of their pocketbook and other things. So I think it's going to be a change election and it will be on the economy, which will have the Conservatives winning in both categories. OK, Aaron, well, thank you very much for your time. I hope uh, you adjust to life uh, without Molly, your daughter, who you've just dropped off at university. I, too, have a Molly. And as you said, the world needs more Mollies. They Thanks certainly do. And they, they get older fast. So give your Molly a hug. Yeah. Happy second birthday. My Molly's only and I'll, my Molly's two and Friday's. So. Well, enjoy that because I remember too, like it was yesterday and 
Molly's at Queens and already loving university. So uh, we've got a great country, John. There's some challenges we have, but hopefully our Molly's will make it even better. I hope so. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.